On January 22, 1905, Tsarist troops fired on protesters in St. Petersburg, Russia in what would infamously be known as Bloody Sunday. This bloodbath resulted in many worker reforms. 1905 was an important year for football as well, also dealing with deaths and injuries that almost shut the game down for good. In this episode, we're going to explore how various rule changes saved the game of football forever, leading to what you and I now know as the NFL. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to Come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great Scott! This time as we step off our DeLorean, the date is October 9th, 1905, and we are at the White House. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, what are we at the White House for? It's October. Don't the Super Bowl champs normally get invited to the White House, uh, you know, after they have the victory? Not in October before it's ending. What's going on here? Well, it was different. Because back then, we didn't have the Super Bowl. I mean, we've discussed this already. We didn't even have the NFL. 1905, there was a different reason why President Teddy Roosevelt would call leaders from top collegiate powers to the White House. He would grab leaders from Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. Now, probably the most important attendee was Mr. Walter Camp himself. You know, the father of American football. And you may have uh, heard that I said the collegiate powers. I didn't say the professional football, the NFL, whatever powers. That's because at the time, the college ranks, now they ruled the roost. They were the top dogs. So they made all the changes happen. But the reason why they were here, because the game, you know, back at the turn of the century was much different than it is today. The brutality, it was of such a proportion where football was almost shut down for good. I mean, the Chicago Tribune in 1904 reported that there were 18 deaths and 159 serious injuries. Then in 1905, the Tribune claimed that it was the year of the death harvest, where there were 19 fatalities and 137 serious injuries. So this was a big deal. Like I said, Teddy Roosevelt had to come and, you know, get these guys together to come up with something so it wouldn't get shut down. And out of this, some radical rule changes were approved for the 1906 collegiate season, which would reduce the absurd violence, but didn't eliminate it, you know, all the way. The pro game, it was still like a little bit of a baby, so they were following the collegiate rules still at the time. Now, we talked about this event and all of the other contributions that Walter Camp, the father of American football, made to the game regarding rule changes in the first episode of the show, which, by the way, you can get there by heading to the show notes on your podcast player or over at thefootballhistorydude.com. Also, I ask that you please subscribe for free to this show by mashing that little subscribe button on your podcast player of choice. That way you get the freshest, hottest out the press episodes each and every week. But let's jump to this 1906 season, because this would be the first year that they would legalize the forward pass. Now, this would be a major contributor to the advancement of the game, just not from a player safety perspective only, but really from a fan excitement, because, you know, you have that multiple attack type style, and Although there would ultimately cause other issues and injuries, you know, the various types of chop blocks and the pass interference and the guy going over the field and getting jacked up over the middle and that kind of thing, there were some balls were rolling in the right direction. And that forward pass on October 27, 1906, this would be the day of the first authenticated forward pass at the pro level. And it would come in a game where the Massillon Tigers were taking on a combined Bentwood and Moundsville where George Peggy Parrott of Massillon tossed a completion to Dan Bullet Riley, and there was the very first authenticated forward pass at the pro level. It wasn't the NFL at the time, but it was still professional football. We talked about this earlier in uh, the first episode, where Walter Camp really did help push this through, as well as many other rule changes for excitement, but he kind of was opposed at first to the forward pass. But imagine this, before the forward pass, Let's just go back in our DeLorean to take a little peek ski at what the game would look like. You got the ball and the, you know, before it wasn't even a snapping and a having the line of scrimmage, but then you snap the ball, dude gets the ball, he picks it up, runs into the line, smashes, crashes down, falls over, and then you get back up and you just got the next play over again. Well, the introduction of the forward pass, all of a sudden now the defense has to look out for 
aerial attack, they gotta look out for the run game, you got different kind of things you gotta defend. So that makes a huge improvement to the excitement of the game. And there are just way too many rule changes uh, throughout the history of the NFL to mention, but let's jump forward to that 1932 season. The NFL was just like a 12-year-old still following mommy and daddy around with, uh, you know, relationships to the rules that it is. They would follow the collegiate rules until the decision in 1932. This is when the NFL decided we're going to spread our wings. We changed a few rules here and there and stuff, and we talked about it. But this was when the NFL decided to appoint the first rules committee. That would end up becoming, nowadays, the competition committee. This was where they decided... No longer will we follow collegiate rules. We are going to implement various professional rules of our own that way we have a chance to separate ourselves from the collegiate ranks. But like I said, a little bit later on, you know, with the 1932, we have the the rules committee. Then in 1968, the then commissioner, Pete Rizzo, he's the one that created what would become known as the competition committee as part of the merger. And this is this committee is not just in charge of, you know, keeping competition out there. They're in charge of making the game safe and entertaining. And I'm going to give you a quick little list of the current members of the competition committee. The chairman is Rich McKay, whom is the president of the Atlanta Falcons. We have the New York Giants owner, John Mara. The Dallas Cowboys owner, Stephen Jones. Well, he's, you know, Jerry, the owner, pretty much. He does everything, but... You know, Stevens, the COO, the executive VP, the player personnel director, and the president of AT&T Stadium. Then we also have the Green Bay Packers president, Mark Murphy, Baltimore Ravens general manager, Ozzie Newsom, Pittsburgh Steelers head coach, Mike Tomlin, Denver Broncos general manager, John Elway, and rounding it out with New Orleans Saints head coach, Sean Payton. Now, I'm sure they're good, but a couple names there popped out at me. It was Sean Payton who was part of, you know, Bounty Gate, and there's Mike Tomlin. Remember that dude where, you know, he stepped out in front of the kickoff returner there back in a Thanksgiving game? But neither here nor there. Maybe they had to, you know, make amends, and they had to get on the competition committee because they knew that there were some things that could be a myth in the NFL. But like I said, neither here nor there. Let's jump back to 1932. You see, one of the big changes, as we've discussed in a couple other episodes, was, remember Bronco Nagurski when he tossed that pass to Red Grange in the first championship? But it was a questionable play because he was, uh, let's say there's controversy that he was not more than five yards behind the line of scrimmage. You and me were like, well, yeah, as long as he's behind the line of scrimmage, he's good to go, right? Well, back then, the rule was the tosser of the ball had to be more than five yards behind the line of scrimmage. Let's just say they changed it after that, and then things would kind of help improve the passing game moving forward. We also spoke of the hash mark rule after that dome game, which would kind of make a big difference as far as giving offenses a chance to bring the ball back to the hash in the middle of the field. That way you had more room to work with on both sides. But now we're going to go, you know, some of the other rule changes and discuss beyond 1932. The first one that I want to talk about is in the World War II era. You see, up until this point, the NFL actually placed restrictions on substitutions. You, you're out there, you play the whole thing, you know, you play from the offensive side, the defense, you play the special teams, you got no rest. You couldn't even have coaching coming in from the bench from what it looked like on NFL.com. Now, we've talked about these Iron Men many times throughout the course of the Football History Dude podcast, but the World War II era, that would make some things happen. It would bring about some changes. And these changes all revolved around the restrictions that the NFL placed on substitutions. Of course, unfortunately, during the war, lineups were depleted because they were being drafted into the war. So in 1943, the NFL decided to let teams substitute players at will. But then, after the war, 1946, they brought it back where they're going to have some restrictions. But by this time, they realized it was way too popular. So in 1949, they went back to that whole free substitutions thing. Thus, this would create separate players for offense and defense. Now, we're starting at this time to really transform the competition and excitement of the game. I mean, think about it. Sure, I mean, we love the whole Bronco Nagurski stories or even Red Grange and all these guys, they play both ways the whole time and, you know, their offense, defense, special teams. But that leads to not having any specialization. I mean, nowadays we joke about the defensive back. If you can't catch, you're relegated to the defense, right? You know? Back then, try to figure that one out. Just got to deal with it both ways. But like I said, 
this rule allowed for specialization of the players. That way they could hone in on their specific skills, making the game more entertaining to watch, which at the time was one of the biggest changes of the 1940s. And here's a quote from the Rules Committee in 1940 that went as such. Each game should provide a maximum of entertainment insofar as it can be controlled by the rules and officials. The entertainment value of the game could be measured by the number of plays per game of a type that would be pleasing to an audience. End quote. So what does that mean? I mean, the NFL, basically, they were tracking it all the time. Like, what resonates with the fans? Because the ultimate goal of getting those fan seats in the butts and the... The what? Flip that around. The butts in the seat. That's what I meant to say. That's what we're going to go with. We got to implement some rules. Shift gears towards that and you will have a winning formula geared towards taking us to the promised land of becoming the top sport in America. And a major influencer in this from basically from the 1930s all the way to the early 1950s was a gentleman by the name of Hugh Ray Shorty, who would end up becoming a member of the Professional Football Hall of Fame for his contributions to officiating and rulemaking. But what really set him apart from the others was he had, from a statistical basis, you know, so this was fact, he proved out that there was a direct correlation between scoring and higher attendance, which indicated that the fans were excited and they wanted to come see all the points that were flying off the board. I mean, take this last Super Bowl, for instance. How many times did you hear people around you say that this last Super Bowl, man, it sucked? You know, there wasn't any points. It was nothing but a snooze fest, a bunch of dudes swinging their legs and kicking the ball in the sky and all that kind of thing. But I tell you what, if you really looked at it, it was closer than most Super Bowls. I mean, it had a great defensive struggle of a chess match between Merlin and Arthur with Belichick being the wizard and Arthur was the chosen one, you know, the chosen king, which was Mr. Sean McVay himself. Ultimately, the wizard won that battle, but let's just say that Shorty still has a huge impact on the game today, because the NFL still uses statistics. Of course, you gotta, you know, have the statistics for the players and all that kind of thing, but I'm talking beyond it, beyond the game, behind the scenes. There's probably not too many decisions that the NFL makes without having some kind of statistical basis to prove it upon, of which... You know, they can have a determined outcome where they can at least have a high probability of success. But with all that being said, let's jump to the 1950s and beyond. We're going to quickly list some of the major rules. Of course, you know, like I said, not even close to covering them all. But uh, here we go. In 1951, they processed a rule where the quarterback, you know, they couldn't pass to the tackle guard or center. Not eligible for a pass. I'm not even like just thinking. To us, it's just like obvious, duh, yeah, you can't, you know, they even mention if, you know, the Patriots are going to bring out this guy, this big jumbo guy, and, you know, tackle number 63 is eligible on the play and that kind of thing. And, of course, for some reason, only the Packers are the ones that ever end up getting them to catch the ball. Then in 1955, a rule came about that was, you know, talking about more the ball carrier. It declared that the ball carrier was down. If any part of the body part other than the hands or feet while he was in the grasp of an opponent touched the ground. Then 1956, this is where grabbing the opponent's face mask was dubbed illegal. Of course, there were going to be, uh, this is going to take some time before they really made a huge impact in that one. But there were plenty of changes in the 60s, and we covered these throughout the previous episodes discussing the AFL-NFL merger. And, you know, there's, there's a bunch of other ones, like I said, but here's... A little bit of a list from the NFL.com's website where it discussed the different changes of the rules throughout the history of the NFL. So we're going to jump forward to 1972. This was the Immaculate Reception. I mean, many of us have heard of the Immaculate Reception if we haven't even seen it, but those of us that could remember it, you know, and I'm not one of them, but if you were able to watch it live, you thought it was probably this crazy awesome of a play. At the time, it was a rule where they couldn't, what they call, double tap the forward pass, as in they couldn't have two offensive players tip it forward. So, like, if I was tossing the ball, it got hit by the offensive guy, the other guy couldn't catch it, and then move on. They happened to, in this play, rule it that the defender touched the ball first, so it was considered a touchdown. But as with most rule changes, they come from some kind of controversy on a big play or just a whole bunch of them that keep happening. Uh, just trying to clear my throat because you all remember Calvin Johnson and the catch rule. Follow through the motion, eat some popcorn, sit on the bench, and eat, drink a Gatorade swig. I don't know. But that's what it was. We had the immaculate reception and that craziness of the tip pass from Franco Harris caught. At the time, 
it almost would have been called back. Thankfully, like I said, it was Oakland Defender tipped it first, and then they decided in 1978 they're going to officially legalize double-tipped forward passes. Also in 1972, they, they moved the hash marks to where they are currently, within the goalposts, which would, of course, open up the fields on the sides. Then in 1973, in a playoff game, they had what we call the Isaac Curtis rule. Now, Isaac Curtis, he was straight the fastest dude out there. Nobody could catch him. So basically what they did was they just tackled him all the way down the field. So the NFL would put restrictions on how much you could, you know, hackle the pass catcher down the field. In 1973, there was also a uh, announcement. The World Football League was announced. And this time the NFL, well, they were going to take them seriously because we all know what happened with the AFL. So 1974 season, the NFL went on offense. They developed a package of rule changes and there were all sorts of them, but here are a few of them right here. It was the goalposts would move back to the end zone again. They would bring the field goals missed over 20 yards to the other team's line of scrimmage. Kickoffs were moved from the 40 to the 35-yard line. Offensive players on punts couldn't move down the field until the ball was kicked. And then they would change offensive holding from 15 yards to 10 yards. And of course, like I said, that restricted downfield contact. We would have this start in 1974. And here was a quote that came from owner Paul Brown discussing how, you know, because he helped push this rule through and this is what he thought. When we played the Dolphins in Miami last year, they cut Curtis down consistently. I don't think he ever got five yards down the field, but this rule wasn't put in place just for him. It was put in for the excitement of the game, end quote. Now jumping forward to 1978, we had the Holy Roller. This is where Ken Stabler of the Oakland Raiders, now he fumbles the ball. Then two different players on the team, they intentionally either threw the ball or batted the ball forward until someone could fall on it in the end zone. So of course, this new rule went as such. If an offensive player fumbles on fourth down or on any other down after the two-minute warning, only the fumbling player can recover and advance the ball for the offense. Now, 1970s, it was popular for the wide receivers and defensive backs to apply stickum to their hands to catch the ball better. However, Lester Hayes, now, he took it to another level. This is another one of those kind of moments where I'm like, dude, are you serious? Now, he, he pretty much put it everywhere. He had it on his uniform all over the place. And, you know, just imagine all that dirt and stuff that would just stick to him. It would just be like wrapping yourself in honey and rolling around in Cheerios or something. And, you know, I don't know. Put a new take on Honey Nut Cheerios. Like, hey, quit acting like the Chris Nut, dude. But speaking of the final last straw, it was during the Raiders' 1980 championship run where Hayes had 13 interceptions, which, you know, the league's like, we got to put a stop to this. So they banned the substance starting in 1981. Then moving forward to 2012, Trent Richardson, he used the crown of his helmet to run over Kurt Coleman, you know, in the process, of course, knocking his helmet off. So they put a 2013 rule in place where it would prohibit players, now this is the runner or the tackler, from using the crown of their helmet with forcible contact, unless inside the tackles. Now, at least Richardson left a little bit to be remembered by the NFL, but other than that, the dude is pretty much a bust. And then the final one that we're going to discuss was the 2014 NFC Championship game. Navarro Bowman, he stripped the ball from Jermaine Curse and he recovered it. However, ruled Seattle's ball, even though Navarro Bowman clearly stripped that ball and it was, you know, him the one that recovered it. So at the time, the replay, they couldn't allow for fumbles to be reviewed unless it was in the end zone or at the sidelines. The reason cited was too difficult to determine the spot of the ball in the pile. This play helped change the rule and forever would allow the review of loose ball fumbles anywhere around the field. And like I've said, all of these different rule changes throughout the history of the NFL have, they've helped in some way. And each year there are different kind of rule changes and Many revolve around safety, and last year that was definitely a big major uh, push as far as player safety. Of course, there was that big one, you know, the way the quarterback hits are treated. Ultimately, the goal is for safety of the players and preserving the most important position in sports. Even though many people didn't, it was a transition. You know, the refs had to figure out how are we going to call this and make it so we keep the quarterback safe, you know, the guys that are making all those millions of bucks, but at the same time, we got to keep it competitive. So that's what's kind of that unique little bit of a, you know, give or take player kind of game within the game. But with that being said, safety is of the utmost importance. However, fan excitement is a close second because at the end of the day, well, the game that is, the NFL has to have fans excited in the game to keep them coming back for more. 
This brings us to a quote from the 2012 Competition Committee's report, and it goes as such. If someone wants to accuse the National Football League of promoting offense to make the game more exciting, the committee believes the NFL should plead guilty. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the Football History Dude and were able to gain some knowledge nuggets of some of the bigger rule changes in NFL history. Now next week, we get to learn about the evolution of the enforcers of these rules, the zebras on the field, the NFL officials. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads.